Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Strategic Command World War I, a new turn-based strategy and war game out by Fury Software and published by Matrix and Slytherin Games. Uh, this is episode number 20 in our Let's Play of this game. We are playing as the Central Powers, and so far the war's been going pretty well for us. Uh, the Eastern Front is going very well. We've taken uh, Minsk. I think we actually already took Smolensk as well, uh, and we're driving deep into the heart of Russia. Russian national morale is plummeting. In our last episode, we were really focused on destroying the Russian Navy because that has a big impact on Russian morale. And overall, things there are going well. They're bloody, but they're going well. On the Western Front, we've been preparing for a counteroffensive. The Allies have invaded both Belgium and the Netherlands. We've thrown them out of the Netherlands. We've started driving back into Belgium. And this turn will culminate uh, with the Battle of Verdun, a very similar battle to the way the historical battle played out, except perhaps a little bit more favorable to us, but we'll see. Now, this is being pulled from a live stream that I conducted a couple of weeks ago, so I'm actually just going to go ahead and uh, jump out of the way now, turn it back over to the live stream audio and gameplay, and I hope you guys enjoy. Please leave your thoughts below, and I'll catch you at the end. Eric von Falkenhayn, an Irishman named Sir Roger Casemate, is willing to take a large consignment of arms to Ireland to equip the Nationalist and Republican group who are planning a rising against British rule there. He asked for 25 MPPs to fund this venture. It will be a risky mission, but if Casemate manages to deliver these arms and a rising is successful, then it could prove a, to be a major blow against our main enemy. Would you like to authorize the payment to Sir Roger Casemate? If you agree to deliver weapons to the Irish, then their rising will have a greater impact on British national morale, as well as leading to greater damage to Dublin, reducing Britain's income. Sir Roger Casemate's ill-fated mission to deliver arms to Irish rebels ended in failure when he was taken prisoner shortly after he landed in Ireland in April 1916. Casemate had come to distrust the Germans and had sought to dissuade the Irish Republicans from launching the Easter Rising, but he was caught before he could make contact with them, so the Rising went ahead regardless. Okay. I give you weapons, man. UK raises more troops through conscription. Anzac's second corps arrives in England. Gallipoli coming? More blockade stuff. Some famous ace gets his first kill over... The Western Front. Meanwhile, Germany surrenders in Cameroon. The German Socialist Party expels 18 MPs for voting against the war. Fighting breaks out when Pancho Villa raids U.S. territory. Germany develops trench level 3. That's good. Infantry warfare level 2 for Austria-Hungary. Belgium moves their government to Brussels. Right at the front lines, guys? Is that really where you want it? Uh, the Americans last we checked were at 0% either direction, so not leaning anyway for war. The British, meanwhile, continue their drive into Iraq. The Russians move a naval unit out. They also move a battle cruiser out. It'll be they, they didn't use up all their movement points, though, so presumably they will fall back into port. The Russians move some cavalry into Odessa. That makes sense. Yeah, we're not sinking their ships either, but I, you know... I, all bets are off, you guys. I, it's easy to say the Americans won't enter the war because we haven't attacked their their shipping. We haven't done a lot of different things. But let's be honest, guys. <laughs> I, the Entente invaded Belgium and the Netherlands. So the Americans could decide to go to war just because they're assholes. I don't know. Oh, yeah, maybe the French will declare war on the Americans. That that would be also within the realm of, of possibility. <laughs> I hope I can sink two Russian ships there. They may still fall back. Oh no, British air units have made it to Greece. Well, better air than ground, I guess. Yeah, they were trying their own Schlieffen, basically.
Spring attacks all over the front. Heavy fighting in Italy. Rebels attacking near Medina. Medina? Medina? Heavy air battles occurring over the southern western front. Here comes the sun. Da -da -da -da. The British are deploying more troops to, uh, to Iraq. We need to be careful about that. I think I forgot about our troops in Egypt again. Yep, they just pulled that troop back. So the only unit we can sink is this Russian destroyer up here. Or maybe it's a cruiser, I'm not sure. Oh, and maybe that... Well, we can't... I don't have ASW tech to sink that sub, probably. But warships are a good way to give a huge hit to enemy national morale. More blockades. New German U-boat. German morale still at 100%. austria hungary is at 126. The Russians are at 5. Cavalry is heading south. These troops are digging in. The morale is incredibly low. Nonetheless, we're forming front lines in Iraq. Moving this core over to the east to Baghdad. These guys will reinforce. We're advancing on El Alamein. Be great to get to Alexandria, but I'm guessing the enemy has troops there. Alright, so... Interesting. So we can go for Athens. Got it! But I can't move troops into it. Pfft. Great. Well, we can't move troops into Athens. That's lame. But we did destroy a unit there, so they'll probably move a new unit into Athens next turn. And if it's this infantry unit up here, then it's going to be in a bit of trouble because you get penalized if you you don't. You, they're not going to be dug in or anything like that. Meanwhile, before we forget about it, let's go destroy that Russian uh, Russian ship. We use our seaplane tender against their sub. Can our subs attack their subs? No. They have two subs. That's really annoying. The Russians are going the German route. Submarine warfare. Well, let's pull our ships out of here then. I don't want to get destroyed. By enemy subs. hundred percent okay putting my own subs close to the Russians though because they don't have any more anti-submarine warfare ships and 
Diva or however you pronounce that. Yeah, we just destroyed another enemy unit. So Russian national morale is still at 5%, but they lose another unit. Meanwhile, what's their uh, strength at? They're at 37. Poltava falls. 71 national morale bonus. We need a headquarter up there in the north. Maybe we can put one in Poltava, actually. Two to one, that actually is three to one. All right, we take Babrushk. Drive in the enemy headquarter at Gomel. Oh, I thought we were gonna destroy it. Nice. We destroy the enemy headquarter at Gomel. This guy here. I'm not sure what that'll do to supply. Yeah. It doesn't exactly break the supply, though. Still just moves it forward a little bit. So another enemy unit destroyed at Gomel. Again, that should... All these casualties should influence Russian morale. They've lost three more units this turn. It's just so inefficient. We've got all of these troops tied up. So supply next turn will be what? Three, 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 four. Not good enough to attack Odessa, I don't think. Where did they move their battleship? Over here to Novoresk, or however you pronounce it. I just don't understand how they can get out of there without being engaged. It's a little bit frustrating. Okay, so we're going to try and catch these soldiers. These guys have nowhere to rail to because we've cut the rail line in the south and in the north. So they're probably stuck there. So we should be able to destroy this fighter and HQ next turn as well. As well as taking the city of Gomal. Spring is coming to Russia. I mean, I need more. I, I need more headquarters. That's the the net net of it. Riga, so maybe we'll get the garrison at Divinisk. I'm guessing taking cities also has somewhat of an impact on national morale, maybe reduced. The Russian morale in the Caucasus, interestingly enough, is very strong. I guess that makes sense. They haven't been losing there. Okay. So 
this Austro-Hungarian Corps gets in behind these guys. So we've nearly destroyed these partisans in Arabia. But then we've got to deal with the other ones up here. Then we've got to deal with the British invasion in Iraq. Hopefully we can crush Greece. Destroyed that... Aww. Destroyed that Italian core. Boom! Two Italian cores down. Wow, that Italian front opened up a bit. I don't know if that's because we pulled the garrisons to the west. It could have been because we sacrificed that one garrison unit here advancing to the west. We've taken Undine, which should be a major morale boost for our troops. That is a, a national morale center. We'll entrench there. So a little bit of success on the Italian front. Attack everywhere! That is your directive! All right, meanwhile, we're done. The weather has cleared. Can't hit Verdun with my railgun yet. Oh, I thought I was going to destroy that guy. Okay. Can't hurt this guy. So we've got artillery on multiple sides. Go ahead and fly recon over here. We'll get interceptors, we get escorts. So we get fierce air battles over Verdun. As we try and gain recon on them, we do gain recon. Go ahead and try and bomb them with our blimps. We get intercepted again. No escorts, so we get shot up pretty bad. Don't really do any damage there. Meanwhile, the enemy is entrenched at level 10. It's a major fortress. I do think we have 10 artillery pieces, though. So that should drop their... It will. So it drops their entrenchment level 1. Every artillery shell, we fire at them. So this is the historical battle of Verdun. It'll also drop their morale. You can see they're down to 64% morale, 75% effectiveness, 58, 71, 52, 69. There we just did some damage to them. Their morale is now below 50%. These guys are concussed and shell-shocked. Their entrenchment is almost completely gone. Their morale is down below 40%. A second casualty inflicted. They're at 34% morale, 55% readiness. We can hit them with a couple more artillery shells here. We're using up, like, the entire stockpile of the national artillery. Which could be a problem. I mean, we didn't use the, the units to the north. Alright, so these German troops can attack 1 to 5. 1 to 4. Verdun is heavily damaged from combat. These troops advance into Verdun. And Verdun has fallen. You know, we're going to swap those troops. We're done. We're done is German. Nice try, Franz. Franz Josef? No. Alright. Um, 
Too bad we used, like, all of our artillery there. But hey, it worked. Epnel is pretty vulnerable, too. British Marines down at Epnel. Got it! Another major fortress falls to the German military. As we advance through Epnel, this time we didn't majorly damage the fortifications either. Okay, these troops need to upgrade. Reinforce. Trench. Rotate these entrenchments, boys. Reinforce these Dutch troops, these German troops. So I did win the battle at Verdun, at least for the moment. I expect an enemy counterattack. But I am going to reinforce the troops that I can. Shift these troops south. Okay. Move that artillery into position here with its six shells. All right, moving other artillery to the front. So we're keeping our artillery near the front. I probably should research more shell production, that's fair. So for Dun Verdun has fallen, that should be a national... That should be a big hit to the French national morale. They're at 48% right now. Uh, meanwhile, the German fleet is pulling back. In Russia, the Russian front is done, I think. Yep. The Italian front is done. The Greek front. The Egyptian front. We already did Egypt. So I think that's everything. Except for ha perhaps some repairs for some of our warships in port, and then maybe getting some research on shell production. Okay, so we're slowly going to pull the German fleet back in the Baltic. I'm going to leave some troops or some ships around there in the event that they do sally out against us. It might be an opportunity to, to sink a few. M Russian morale is down to 4%. We'll see what the loss of Verdun does to French morale. In terms of German research, uh, production technology, no industrial technology... Just MPPs. I guess we need gas and shell production. So we'll invest a lot there just to get it kick-started because we haven't really invested anything so far. 
The Austrians don't have a lot of artillery, so they probably don't need to invest a ton there. The Austrians have a lot of money to play with. Uh, we do have some new units. We can deploy these guys in the North Atlantic. Austro-Hungarians. They do Marines, Mountain Corps, Cav, Artillery. We should do some Artillery. Maybe even a Railgun? I don't know where that's going to be useful. Um, I can't research a Headquarters. I don't have enough money anymore. No. Alright, we're going to save some of that money for next turn. All right, so we're going to move forward to presumably May of 1916. See what happens here with the fall of uh, Verdun. That should hurt their morale. Um, I don't think the Germans from a armored warfare. Well, we can research that. Austrians also. Might be too late, honestly, for some of those research categories. Meanwhile, Romania is slightly in favor of the Central Powers. But let's go ahead and move forward and see what happens here as we move into May of 1916 after the fall of Verdun in a uh, absolutely tremendous artillery barrage uh, that won. The defeat on the Izonzo. Uh, Loss of Undyne lowers Italian morale. Austria-Hungary Austria celebrates victory on the Izono. Or Izonzo. French morale falls due to the loss of Verdun. Germany celebrates the capture of Verdun. Norway continues to complain about attacks on their merchantmen. Odessa militia is mobilized. Russia's morale is down to 4%. Like, they should really be ready to just be like, Hey, guys, we're out of the war. Agatha Christie works on her first po P oh, Perot novels. The only bad thing is, when if the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk comes into play, if we actually have the historical treaty, I think we might actually lose income as Germany. Yep, so that garrison, or that army unit moves. See, I don't like how they can just sail right through my ships. That was not the case in, in Str Strategic Command World War II. You actually couldn't move through units at sea. Which I think it, it's good that you can move through, like, minefields with smaller ships, because that seems about right. A pirate Nile. Arg! It's Perot, man. Perot. Why does it show nothing in Athens? We know they're in Athens. I'm guessing my troops are also besieging the port because its supply level's down to two. So it'll be interesting to see how the Allies react. I'm expecting a fierce counterattack at Verdun. Fortunately for us, there's only a two front. They don't have three units around each side or anything like that. Granted, there is only a detachment guarding their, their flank. So they could destroy that and then move in. But that would require... A lot of units to be on the offensive. Wow, row. Well, that's a long range blimp bombing. Enemy has aircraft. The enemy has invested a lot of money in aircraft. I've largely just ignored it. I've just kind of been like, all right, whatever. Aircraft or a thing. Meanwhile, large enemy artillery bombardments in the north at Antwerp. Also near Verdun. So we could be expecting counterattacks. Or it could just be the enemy kind of fleeing the only thing it can do against us, I guess. That's possible. The British are deploying substantial forces in Mesopotamia. That's a little bit concerning. That could really come into the heart of the Ottoman Empire. 
The only good thing is I imagine they lack sufficient supply to, to do much down there. Large-scale attacks Antwerp, but it's not enough to break the Dutch forces there. Meanwhile, the Russians continue to pull troops out of the Caucasus. Their line there gets holier and holier. I think it's more of a morale thing, P. Warner, than it is like an actual Verdun is valuable type of a thing. Okay. Socialist agitation lowers Russian determination to continue the war. Partisan activity in Minsk. Fuck! Oh no! That's right on my supply line. I left it ungarrisoned. Conscription leads to industrial unrest. Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg make anti-war speeches at Berlin May Day rally. Lenin calls on socialist meeting in Switzerland to transform the war into a class war. No, I did not say... All right, everyone, that's going to do it for this episode. We fought the Battle of Verdun, and we won it. We successfully took the city and fortress at Verdun. Uh, we have also seen Russian partisans rise up in the east uh, along our supply line at Minsk, uh, threatening the supplies to all of our troops uh, in the forward areas operating in Russia. I still think we're probably okay, but that's something we'll have to keep a close eye on. Hopefully all we need to do is shift a few troops back uh, to the west and we can crush them really quickly. It is important, though, because it is on a major rail line and roadway uh, that, that feeds our forward troops. I'd also like to put a headquarters unit there as well to try and bring supplies forward. But with that all being said, we've just concluded the most recent turn. Things are continuing to go well, and I think this makes as good of a stopping point as any. So... Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. We'll pick it up in our next episode. Uh, this has been episode number 20 of Strategic Command World War One by Fury Software. Uh, and as always, guys, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you for watching, and until next time, I'm out.